Let me just open with prayer. God, just thank you for tonight, and I thank you for this lesson because I know how powerful it is in our lives when we are able to accomplish something that sometimes feels so impossible to forgive those who have hurt us. And God, I just pray for your strength um, tonight to teach this lesson, that I would be articulate and clear, and that you would use it to help others that are here tonight. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm a grateful follower of Jesus who continues to help me face and work on my fears and my false beliefs and now my grief. And my name is Tanya. Tonight's lesson is the forgiveness lesson. And this lesson and the inventory lesson, I think, are two of the most challenging lessons to teach here and uh, celebrate recovery because there's so much to them. But if we understand them better and we understand how to use them and implement them into our journeys, the impact that it can have on our uh, process and progress is huge. And so I uh, have a lot of information I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. Know that this is a fully loaded subject with lots of in information in it. And we're going to record this lesson. And so um, if you feel like it was too much information, just come back and watch it. Alex will put it online. It'll be on our website. And you can check it out on our CR webpage. But one of the reasons why I think a lot of us struggle with forgiveness is many of us struggle with forgiving and letting go of the hurt that other people have done to us. And some of us struggle with forgiving ourselves for our own mistakes that we have made. And then there's others that might have tried forgiving or have walked through the process of what they thought was forgiving others for their past mistakes, but still end up feeling angry and resentful. And they don't know why that continues to pop up after they've forgiven others. Wherever you're at in the spectrum tonight, I hope after this lesson, you're going to have a better idea of how to grasp forgiving others to, and do it in a biblical way and also very practically. And like I said, I have a lot of information. So um, you have your handouts um, that will help you. I also have a handout that you can pick up after our meeting tonight. They're on the back table. Digger has them back there. This has even more information. A few things I'm going to take out of this I will share with you, but this has even more information I got from a counselor that they use in counseling um, to help people walk through forgiving others. But let's jump in and get going uh, first with tonight's principle six, which is evaluate all my relationships Offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me and make amends for harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. In step eight, we made a list of all the persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Luke 6.31 says, do to others as you would have them do to you. So tonight I'm going to cover different aspects of forgiveness. We're going to answer the question, why should we even forgive others? We're also going to cover some misconceptions about forgiving, which has hindered many working on the forgiveness process. We're also going to go over three areas of forgiveness that we always need to evaluate. And then last but not least, we're going to walk through four steps of how to forgive somebody who has hurt you or maybe greatly wounded you that you're really struggling getting over or getting past. So jumping in, the first question was, why should we forgive others? And it's basically because Jesus says so. In Colossians 3.13, it says, Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And this can be a hard verse to swallow because this verse wasn't a suggestion made by God. It was a command. And did you notice that the verse didn't say, you know, forgive those that you think deserve it or forgive those that you feel like forgiving? And honestly, I, I really think that forgiveness would be so much easier if we could pick and choose the people we want to forgive. <laughs> but the truth is, in order to learn more about how to become like Christ, we have to practice forgiving others, even if they don't deserve it or earn it. Another reason we need to forgive is because one day we are going to need forgiveness from others. Because we're all messed up, sinful, dysfunctional human beings saved by grace. And because of our humanity, we will mess up and hurt others that we care about. It's going to happen. And so the sooner we learn how to clean up our mess, the better we're going to get at keeping our side of the street clean. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. 
When you practice asking for forgiveness, you are a living example of what Christ did for you. And your example could impact others when you do that for them. I know I've given Dave many opportunities to practice forgiving me over the 30 years we've been married. And honestly, his example to forgive me over and over has helped me to do the same for him when I've needed to forgive him for his shortcomings. Now I want to get into a couple misconceptions that could get in the way and mess you up on forgiveness. And I find there's two that many misunderstand on this topic. The first one is, if you forgive, that means you should instantly trust that person without seeing proof or evidence of change. And that's simply not true. In the past, when you have forgiven others, you might have handled it one of two ways. You confronted the person about what they did. They said they were sorry. You forgave. You opened yourself up blindly to trust them again. Or we live in fear of opening up ourselves again, that we avoid the conversation altogether, hold on to the hurt, fearing if we forgive it, it will make us vulnerable once again. And neither of those are the correct ways to deal with forgiveness. We have to understand that forgiveness and trust are two totally different topics that we have to address. Forgiveness has to do with the past, but trust has to do with the future. When we forgive, we are choosing to let go of what happened in the past. But to move forward into the future, the rebuilding of trust must take place so a relationship can be restored. Sometimes those who need our forgiveness will not like hearing that they have a responsibility to rebuild trust and show you they're changing. And that is why we will have to talk about what those steps need to be. What do they need to look like? Sometimes you might have to say nicely, I love you or I care about you and I forgive you for what you've done but you need to show me that you've changed going forward so I can learn to trust you again. And that is why we will need to define conditions or consequences to them to show us that they're changing. Saying you're sorry can get things started, but it's never gonna be enough to rebuild trust to restore a relationship. Now, if you don't know what those boundaries are to set, get with a counselor, get some help. A counselor can help you be realistic, with realistic expectations to make sure both parties are taking steps in the right direction. So to summarize this misconception, forgiving is our part. Setting healthy boundaries, enforcing them, that's our part. Proving they have changed and rebuilding trust is their part. Another common question that I I get a lot, that I hear a lot, is many people will ask when they're dealing with ongoing forgiveness for the same thing over and over at the same person, how many times do I have to keep on forgiving this person? And the answer is, as many as it takes. Matthew 17, 21, 22 says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven whole times? He was like counting. I guess that was a biblical thing. Seven, I don't know why he didn't say 40, because that's another biblical number, but he picked seven, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven, which demonstrates not that it's a number or how many times it's meant that it's ongoing. It's part of our life. It's part of how we live out our Christianity and showing and demonstrating, doing for others what God has done for us. So it's our responsibility to continue practicing forgiving others. It's also our responsibility to put those boundaries into place to protect ourselves from being hurt over and over So the other person, if the other person doesn't want to change. Otherwise, if we kid ourselves into believing or hoping that just because we forgave them will mean they won't do it again, that's denial. And we must have a plan for the steps they will take to show us that they're trying to change. The second misconception that many people can get misunderstood or uh, get caught up in is sometimes we hold back on forgiving others because we think if we forgive them that it will mean what they did was okay. And there is never any good excuse or reason for someone to hurt us, but it will happen. And when we choose to forgive, we need to remember that forgiveness is not for them. It's for us. Forgiveness will never settle the score. It never says who's right or wrong, and it never gets us justice. But it is the only way we can get out of the prison of the pain from the pain that we've been in from what others have done to us. And this misconception in particular can be really hard for anybody who's struggled with or been in emotionally, physically, or sexually abusive relationship. And as a matter of fact, CR rewrote steps eight and nine for those who have been abused. Step eight says, make a list of all the persons who have harmed me and become willing to seek God's help 
in forgiving your perpetrators, as well as in forgiving yourself. Really realize that you've also harmed others and become willing to make amends to them. And step nine says, extend forgiveness to yourself and to others who perpetu perpetuated against you, realizing that this has everything to do with the attitude of your heart, whether or not it involves a physical confrontation. Make direct amends asking forgiveness from those people you've harmed, except when to do so would injure them or others. I just want you to know that if you've been abused, I feel your pain because I grew up with fathers who were verbally and physically abusive. And learning how to forgive my abusers here in CR has helped me tremendously in my recovery. It freed me to let go of what they did and has helped me to turn my focus to notice and identify my triggers that have stemmed out of the abuse. And that is where a lot of my fears and false beliefs have come from. But this couldn't have happened for me if I didn't first work on forgiving them. So if you were stuck in one of these misconceptions, I hope you will find freedom to not live out of them anymore. Now we're going to talk about the three areas of forgiveness that we need to always look at and evaluate in our lives. The first one is to forgive others. And this is what we do when someone has hurt us. Matthew 6.14 says, If you forgive others when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. No matter what others have done, we must become willing to forgive. When we practice forgiving others who sinned against us, we are demonstrating to God that we know we will need forgiveness one day as well. Another area we need to always evaluate is making sure we're asking God for his forgiveness. He's ready. He's patiently waiting for us to come to him and confess what we've done. He already knows it, and he's just waiting for us to humble ourselves and to admit it so he can forgive us and we can move forward together. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And this verse has helped me so much in my recovery because I've had some times where I've struggled letting go of guilt and shame from past mistakes I've made. But this verse reminded me that if I confess it, he will forgive me and purify me from all unrighteousness. And that is truth. My guilt and shame want to lie to me and tell me that he won't or I'm not worthy to receive it. So be careful which one you're listening to. The last area and the most overlooked area we need to address is forgiving ourselves. And this is probably the biggest challenge for most of us, especially for those that are filled with any kind of guilt or shame. Many of us have come in here to CR because of the poor choices we've made. Our guilt and shame is eating us alive as we struggle with the belief that we aren't worthy or deserving of God's forgiveness or the things we've done, but that's a lie. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, remembers your sins no more. I don't know why, but it always seems easier to beat myself up over my mistakes than to forgive myself. <laughs> but I had to start telling myself that if God has forgiven and forgotten my sins, then I need to do the same. Yep. So now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of the lesson which is how to effectively forget of others who have hurt you. This is to help you walk through the process. If you're struggling with maybe you've forgiven somebody and the anger and resentment keeps coming back up and continues to plague you. But before I get into the steps of how to forgive, let me just say that this process will never settle who's right or wrong, fairness or justice. God settles that on judgment day. Amen. And we are for forgiving others to be obedient to God's commands, to imitate Christ's example, and because we know forgiveness is for us and not for them. So the first step to forgiving is to confirm the hurt, feel the offense. Refuse to insulate yourself from healing by minimizing the pain with excuses. We need to admit that we, how we've been hurt and how it made us feel, which quite honestly, if you go back to any of your inventory sheets, anybody who's been in a 12-step, that's column two and column three. We need to make sure we do not minimize those events by making excuses for what they did or minimize our feelings by ignoring, stuffing, or medicating them. One of the best ways I've learned to help me confirm the hurt and feel the offense is to do what I call as a burn letter. A burn letter is what, is what we do when we write a letter to our offender, but we never, ever, ever mail it. In this letter, we tell them exactly how their actions made us feel, and they usually aren't very pretty words. And then you read it to your sponsor. You never mail it or give this letter to your offender. 
<laughs> I can't stress that enough. And after you reach your sponsor, you burn it, you shred it, you put it down the garbage disposal, flush it down the toilet, whatever works for you. Because that is a symbolic way to acknowledge that we're ready to release that pain, the hurt, and let go of our resentment, anger, and bitterness that came with it so we can move forward in our healing process. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so you may be healed. Confessing the ugliness of how you felt to another is very powerful and freeing. So be sure that you read that letter to somebody you trust. And do not save them to read over and over and over to yourself because this will defeat the whole purpose and only serve to remind you of the harm of what you've been through and re-traumatize yourself over and over. And that's not the purpose or the intent. It's just to help you name the offense and feel the hurt. Once you do that, then you've also practically walked into step number two, which was confess the hate, face the offense. Just like my kitty cat up there on the wall, you might find that you're saying some words in there about hate or wishing somebody was never born or who knows what you might be writing in those burn letters. But it's okay to confess that hate. It's okay to confess whatever you're feeling inside. It's normal to hate those who've wounded you deeply. And this doesn't make you a bad person or unchristlike. It makes you honest and transparent with the truth of how you feel. And God can take it, and it's the best way to clean out some of the hurt from the pain left behind. I had a lot of hateful words and feelings come up when I wrote my burn letters to my stepdads who abused me. I didn't even realize how much I had minimized my hurt and stuffed my feelings until I had written those letters. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 8 says, there is time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. And I like to emphasize a time to hate. There is a time to hate and express it safely. And doing this through your burn letter will all be helpful so you don't have to be afraid to say those words. After we do that, then we choose to heal, number three, and forgive our offender. After you've done steps one and two, you need to pray for God to help you forgive your offender and then say a prayer to forgive them. As in this handout that I was mentioning I have in the back, there's actually a prayer in here that uh, you can use. If you're not for sure how to pray for the person you're wanting to forgive, you can use the prayer that's in this handout you can pick up. There's a sample in there, and it's really good. I've used it. Matthew 5.44 says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You may not feel like you can pray for those who hurt you, but it is critical in order to move to the last step, which is number four, come to harmony. Choose to free the offender and yourself. And harmony is the place we've come to if we truly work steps one, two, and three. We have acknowledged our hurt and feelings. We wrote out our burn letters. We read it to someone we trust. We burned it, and we prayed the prayer to forgive them. Then to live in harmony with our past, we choose to free them and ourselves by praying for them regularly, specifically praying for God's blessings over them. Being able to pray God's blessings over them is one way to know you have worked those three steps correctly. Romans 15.5 says, May God who gives steadiness, patience, and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other, each with the attitude of Christ toward the other. When you can pray God's blessings for them, you know you're making progress to live in harmony with your past. You may even notice several other benefits when this happens. First benefit is your perspective will begin to change when you're able to focus on looking, in the, looking for the good and the bad, the gain in your pain, and what makes you grateful, not hateful. Another benefit for working the forgiveness process by praying for those who have hurt us without reservation, is we take away their power they once had over us. When we stop nursing the wounds, the resentment and hatred, is how we know that what the other person did doesn't rule over us any longer. The last thing I want to address before I wrap up is some of you might think, some of you might have forgiven others, but again, like I mentioned earlier, you might still be feeling bitter or resentful. You may walk through those first three steps Start trying to pray for your offender, and you can't. You can't pray blessings for them. If that happens, which it can, you need to go back and redo steps one, two, and three. There is something from your pain that you haven't either named or acknowledged yet. 
So don't give up. It is a process, and you have to work it. You just can't, with people who have deeply wounded you, pray that simple prayer to forgive them and move on and act like nothing's happened. You have to work through the process to truly forgive so you can let go and move forward in your life and move to harmony. So don't give up. Just keep working the process. So that's it, and I hope this lesson is helpful to all of you here tonight. Um, like I said, you could pick up the handouts in the back, and um, I gave you a lot to absorb, and so I hope I didn't overwhelm you too much. And again, this lesson's recorded. If you need to come back and watch it on our site, you can. So let's go ahead and stand and say our serenity prayer, and then we'll get to share groups.